to have with us tonight Ron Unz, um, who is a theoretical physicist by training. It's actually a return for him of sorts as he uh, graduated from Harvard as an undergraduate. Uh, Mr. Unz is the chairman of Wall Street Analytics, a Palo Alto-based financial services software company that he founded in New York City in 1987. Uh, in addition to uh, his degree from Harvard, he holds graduate degrees from Cambridge University and Stanford. He's long been interested in public policy issues. In 1994, he launched a surprise Republican primary challenge to incumbent Governor Pete Wilson of California, running on a conservative pro-immigrant platform against the prevailing political sentiment and received 34% of the vote, which is extraordinary for a novice. Later that year, he campaigned as a leading opponent of Proposition 187, the anti-immigration initiative, uh, and spoke at many rallies, including one for 70,000 people. I was part of a pro-immigrant march in Los Angeles, and it was the largest political rally in California history. Um, so you can see he's on different, I mean, it's very hard to typecast him, I think, in terms of what his uh, political persuasion is, and I think he loves to keep it that way. Uh, in 1997, Mr. Unz began the English for the Children Initiative campaign in California after learning of boycotts by Hispanic parents against Spanish language programs in the Los Angeles area. He drafted Proposition 227 and led the campaign to qualify and pass the measure, culminating in a victory at the polls on June 2, 1998. Following the passage of the California measure, he assisted activists in Arizona in passing their own anti-bilingual education initiative, and he's now established a national advocacy organization, English for the Children, to replace bilingual education with English immersion throughout the country. I'm sure it was good news for him as he flew in. Uh, today, uh, it was announced that there are enough signatures had been secured to get the bilingual initiative on the ballot in November. Uh, Mr. Unz has authored hundreds of articles that have appeared on issues ranging from campaign reform to vouchers to China, appearing in publications uh, like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, National Review, and the New Republic. Catherine Snow, as many of you know, uh, is on the faculty here uh, at the Harvard, graduation, Harvard Graduate School of Education. She's the Henry Lee Shattuck Professor of Education uh, in the Human Development and Psychology area. Uh, Catherine is an expert on language and literacy development in children, focusing on how oral language skills are acquired and how they relate to literacy outcomes. Catherine recently chaired a National Academy of Sciences Committee that prepared the report preventing reading difficulties in young children. Her current research activities include a longitudinal study of language and literacy skills among low-income children who have been followed for 13 years since age three. Various attempts to develop consensus among teacher educators concerning what pre- and in-service reading teachers need to know about language and about literacy, and following the language development of young children participating in the early Head Start intervention as well as studying the vocabulary development of first and second language learners. Um, she's also considering various aspects of transfer from first to second language in the domains of language and literacy. Uh, Snow, Catherine has written about bilingualism and its relation to language policy issues, such as bilingual education in the United States and in developing nations, and about testing policy. She is, has also, I believe, just stepped down as the past president of the American Education Research Association. She's written a number of books including and publications, including Starting Out Right, A Guide to Promoting Children's Reading Success, uh, Preventing Reading Difficulties in Young Children, and an article for Psycholinguistics entitled Bilingualism and Second Language Acquisition. Uh, moderating is Tony Randolph, who many of you know from that voice in your head. I was thrilled to meet Tony because she's been traveling with me in my car and at home uh, for years. I think we, we all think of WBUR as part of our families. And I was so astonished to meet her in person that she actually exists out of my radio. <laughs> uh, 
but of course she's uh, a marvelous person tapping into all of the current educational issues and we were so pleased that she agreed to moderate tonight's uh, discussion. Um, she's worked at WBUR for the past five and a half years. She began her broadcast journalism career in commercial radio, um, a little bit of a dirty word in public radio, but I guess they've forgiven you. Uh, and um, soon after graduating from State University, New York College at Buffalo, with a degree in journalism, uh, she also earned a master's degree from the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia. Her first job in public radio was as news director at WBFOFM in her hometown of Buffalo, New York. She later worked as news director in Newark, New Jersey, before moving to Boston in 1996. Uh, and at WBUR, Tony covers general news stories, uh, including things like the Big Dig, which we're having a program on in two weeks, uh, affordable housing, and of course, education. So from now on, Tony's ruling the roost. Uh, she may look gentle, but I can assure you she's quite firm. And uh, so thank you all for coming tonight, and we're off. Thank you, Daddy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much, all of you, for coming out tonight to what I hope will be an interesting and informative debate on bilingual education. Before we hear from tonight's panelists, I just want to take a couple of moments to give you a few facts about bilingual education, although I think a lot of you probably know quite a bit about bilingual education already. About 5% of the state's 976,000 students are what's defined as LEP, or limited English proficient. And basically that means that English is not their first language. And there are about 69 different languages spoken in our schools. Spanish is the most widespread, but other languages include Portuguese, Chinese, Vietnamese, Khmer, Korean, Russian, French, Creole, Greek, and Arabic. And that's just a few. Under current state law, a district must provide bilingual education classes when it has at least 20 students that have the same native language. Students can take classes in their native language for up to three years before they're moved into regular education classrooms. All other students with limited English skills are taking English as a second language classes, which are taught only in English. And as I'm sure many of you already know, which is why you may be here this evening, there are several efforts to change bilingual education in Massachusetts. And under the proposal supported by Mr. Unz, which we'll be discussing tonight, students whose first language is something other than English would be placed in intense English classes for a year before they're placed in regular education. And Mr. Unz, along with many Massachusetts residents, and some of whom may be in this hall tonight, have been collecting signatures and apparently have enough to uh, place the measure on the ballot for 2002 to let voters decide whether to change bilingual education, and that's something he's done successfully in California and Arizona. The format for tonight's debate will allow each speaker up to eight minutes to give opening remarks. Then each will have three minutes of rebuttal time to respond to the other statements. After that, I'll have a few questions for each of them, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, as Dottie says, we don't have a microphone, but we will figure out some sort of way so that everyone, uh, or as many people as possible, will be able to participate um, in some sort of orderly fashion. So now it's time to hear from our panelists, and we'll start with Mr. Ott. Thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to speak before you this evening. One question which had come up obviously towards me very much during the California campaign is, as you can imagine, how in the world did I get involved in this issue? In other words, it seems I speak English perfectly well. Why in the world would I have gotten involved in this issue to begin with? And the answer to that is that I actually come from a little bit of an immigrant background myself, in that my mother was born in Los Angeles, but she grew up not speaking a word of English. Then when she was a young child, about four or five years old, she learned English very quickly and easily. And for that reason, when I'd first heard about these bilingual programs, back when I was in junior high, they never really seemed to make any sense to me. In other words, why didn't the school simply teach English to these children as soon as they began school, rather than keeping them in these other programs, sometimes for many years? The programs never made any sense to me or any sense to any of my parents, any of my friends. 
And that was true in junior high, that was true when I was in high school, when I was in college, when I was in graduate school, during all those years. And according to all the news reports I'd been reading, those programs didn't really seem to work very well. When something doesn't seem to make much sense and it doesn't seem to work very well, you assume it probably will gradually go away. But instead, over that 10 or 20 or 25 year period, it grew dramatically in size. Then, in 1996, when I was living in California, I read a series of articles in the Los Angeles Times about a group of immigrant Latino parents in downtown Los Angeles, very poor garment workers, who actually had to begin a public boycott of their own local elementary school because it refused to teach the children English. Now, when things had reached the point where parents had to carry picket signs outside a public school because it refused to allow their children to learn English, I felt something finally had to be done about it. So I ended up researching the issue of bilingual education much more thoroughly as practiced in California and found some absolutely horrifying statistics. The official data from California at that time, coming from the State Office of Bilingual Instruction, showed that a quarter of all the children in California public schools didn't know English. A quarter of the entire total, 1.5 million students. And of the students who didn't know English, each year only five or six percent allegedly learned English. In other words, 95 percent of all the students in California who started a school year classified as not knowing English end of that school year still classified as not having learned English. And any program that seems to have an official 95 percent annual failure rate I think is a program that something had to be done about. So I organized an effort to put a measure on the ballot to shift the state of California away from these native language oriented so-called bilingual education programs towards a simple and effective system of intensive sheltered English immersion. The idea behind it is extremely simple. When young children start school not knowing English, they would normally be placed in a special classroom with the other children who are also learning English to teach them English as quickly as possible over a period of a few months or possibly a year or possibly even longer than a year. Once they learned English, then they would be moved into the regular classrooms with all the other students. It seemed to make a lot of sense to me and it also made a lot of sense to the voters of California. The campaign we had was probably the most bipartisan initiative campaign in the history of California in that it was opposed by nearly all the Democrats and all the Republicans. It was opposed by the chairman of the state Republican Party and the chairman of the state Democratic Party. It was opposed by President Bill Clinton. It was opposed by all four candidates for governor, Democrat and Republican. It was opposed by nearly every union, nearly every educational organization, nearly all the newspapers in the state and all the political slates. We were also outspent on advertising by a ratio of 25 to one. The other side spent 25 times more money in advertising than we did. Nonetheless, we won in a huge landslide, one of the biggest landslides of any contested initiative campaign in the history of California. And once the political dust had settled and our initiative had been ruled absolutely constitutional by four separate federal judges in a matter of a few weeks, then the reporters started going into the classroom at the beginning of the new school year and seeing the impact of this allegedly disastrous, catastrophic measure which would sweep away a program which had supposedly been so successful. And the results were quite interesting. Virtually every single article which has come out now in California in the last three or four years by these reporters, nearly all of whose newspapers had originally opposed the initiative, has been extremely complimentary, almost flattering. The, these bilingual teachers, or rather ex-bilingual teachers, ex-bilingual administrators, in many cases are saying, we oppose the measure every step of the way, we thought it would be a disaster, but it's working incredibly well. The children are learning English so much more quickly than we ever imagined. That went on for a period of time, and then the test scores start coming in. Now, my point of view of it is that the proof of the pudding of any public policy measure is in the eating. Test scores are a way to see whether something works or something doesn't work. And in the state of California, what we've seen over the last few years is perhaps the most dramatic single rise in academic performance by a large group of students, the immigrant students of California, recorded almost anywhere in the country. What we have seen is that in less than two years after the implementation of the new initiative, the average mean percentile test scores of over a million immigrant students went up by 40%. And that 40% rise includes those school districts in the state of California 
that dragged their heels on implementing the initiative, that tried to keep their bilingual programs. Those that most completely got rid of their bilingual programs were able to double their test scores in less than two years. And in fact, this last year, the test scores of California's immigrant students, again, rose more than qu twice as quickly as the test scores of the non-immigrant students. And I think that is the sort of thing that should be done in Massachusetts as well. Now, the interesting thing about it is, when I was laying the groundwork for the campaign, when I was moving forward with the effort, I did what I consider a lot of due diligence on the issue. I talked with some of America's leading advocates of bilingual education, as well as many of the critics. And the statements these supporters made of the program were really fascinating. Virtually none of them, and that includes organizations, academics, activists, individuals, virtually none of the supporters of bilingual education would defend the program as existed, as it was practiced. They all made excuses for the fact that the program was such a dismal failure. They would say the program admittedly works very badly in these different states, in these different cities. We in no way will defend this program as practiced in California. But they said the problem is not the theory, but the practice. The problem is that the program does not have enough teachers, does not have the right teachers, does not have enough money, does not have the correct curriculum, does not have adm does enough administrative support. That, they said, is the problem. In theory, it works. It just has problems in practice. So I asked them then, can you point to any large-scale example anywhere in the United States where bilingual education has actually worked well? And they couldn't think of a single one. Now, I'm a theoretical physicist by training, as was mentioned in the introduction. In science, in physics, there's a huge difference between theory and experiment. If you have a theory, a theory even backed by leading Harvard University professors, that says that something would work, but if you've tried it over and over and over again throughout the entire United States for a period of 30 years, and it's never actually worked once in practice on a large scale, I say the rules of science are that you throw away the theory. You disregard these theories, you admit the theories are wrong, and you switch to something that does work. In less than, in about a year's time, the people of Massachusetts will have a chance to junk this failed theory of bilingual education, which has never worked anywhere on a large scale in the United States of America, and switch to something that does work, which is intensive English immersion, and will double the test scores of Massachusetts immigrant students, as it is currently doing for over a million immigrant students in California. Thank you very much. Let me uh, add my thanks to Ron Unzis, to all of you for being here, and my uh, condolences for those of you who are getting hotter and more, more uncomfortable in your uh, positions. Let me also say that um, I admire Ron Unz. I think Ron Unz has uh, done something that constitutes good citizenship in many ways. He has focused his attention and his remarkable energy and vigor on issues of, uh, of great importance in public education. And he has made this, uh, this debate possible. Um, I just wish that the vigor with which he uh, approached these issues was matched by an equivalent rigor in thinking about them and in informing himself about the real facts of bilingual education and of second language acquisition and bilingualism. Um, I don't have very much time. Let me just try to make a few points about the basic, the basic facts of bilingual development and bilingual education. First of all, I agree with Mr. Ahns. Quality of educational programs count. Um, we, in every single kind of educational policy, it, it doesn't matter uh, what the theory is if you don't have the theory well implemented. Badly designed bilingual programs are not programs that I would defend or anybody else would defend. On the other hand, I would point out that intensive one-year immersion programs are not particularly well designed. In fact, there is no design for, for one-year immersion in California. The resources that are available to support teachers trying to implement one-year immersion are, uh, if anything, far worse than the resources available to teachers implementing bilingual education. So the alternative here, a one-year immersion program, is a program for which poor quality is also almost inevitably the case. And it's not the case that there are no good bilingual programs in the country. There are many. There are too many poor bilingual programs, but there are many good bilingual programs. 
think about math and science in American schools. There are a lot of classrooms in which math and science is being taught fairly badly with poor curricula and bad teacher preparation. We don't eliminate math and science from the curriculum because it isn't being done well. Um, secondly, uh, Mr. Unz has publicly uh, challenged the idea that it might take longer than a year or, as he said tonight, a year and a little bit to learn English. And, of course, I agree with him. It, you can learn some English in a year. Um, you can learn quite a bit of English in a year. How many um, vocabulary items do we think the children in these intensive immersion programs are managing to learn, the five-year-olds? Maybe 1,000, maybe 1,200, maybe 1,500? That would be a very good outcome at the end of one year of intensive immersion. But it puts children several thousand words behind monolingual English speakers who've been acquiring English since, since birth. Uh, and we know from studies of English learning children and uh, English only children that if they arrive at first grade with vocabulary smaller than 5,000 words or 6,000 words, they're very likely to have trouble learning how to read. Learning how to read is the big challenge in school. It's not speaking English, it's reading English. And children who start the process of learning how to read with limited vocabularies in English are going to have trouble. That is the situation of children who've only had one year of not very good quality intensive immersion. Third, outcomes at the end of kindergarten or even at the end of first grade are really not the outcomes we as educators should be interested in. Um, the long-term outcomes that are of interest to me at least are outcomes uh, in fourth grade reading comprehension. They're outcomes in uh, eighth grade math. The, I want to know whether children can understand stories and predict what might happen next or interpret what the characters are doing. I want to know if they can explain their own reasoning when they do a math problem. I want to know if they can uh, formulate their observations and test hypotheses in their science classes. I want to know whether they're going to get into algebra and trigonometry in high school, whether they're going to get admitted to, to colleges. Um, those are the outcomes that really count. Now, Mr. Unz claims that the SAT scores, the SAT 9 scores in California have gone up because of bilingual education. That is a very, very uh, dubious claim. But even if it were true that first and second graders' SAT 9 scores had gone up uh, because of the elimination of bilingual education, these are not outcomes which are of long-term great relevance for English language learners. Let's think about the challenges of understanding complex texts in fourth grade and ask ourselves whether one year of, of intensive exposure to English is sufficient to prepare children for those tasks. Um, finally, uh, with reference to bilingual education, it's clear that bilingual programs do teach English. That's why they're called bilingual. Um, the presentation that has been uh, given here is, is that children are in other language programs until they are exited from other language programs. Of course, good bilingual programs teach English, and of course, bilingual educators, like the parents of immigrant children, want children to learn English. Uh, some of them might also, the parents as well as the educators, want children to maintain a home language, um, and there is no reason why they're that needs to be in conflict with the task of learning English. So the, the notion that bilingual education programs are not focused on teaching English is, of course, um, just a simple misrepresentation of what's going on in the good programs that we would like to try to replicate. Let me move to a slightly different level with my comments. I comments not about bilingual education, which I could go on talking about a lot longer, but about making better educational policy. Um, as I said, I really admire Mr. Unz and his, his commitment to improving education, and I wish there were more people out there who were, who were citizens who were as interested, but responsible advocacy is informed advocacy, and I wish he would um, pay attention to the research in this area. I wish he would not reject um, educational research, but even if he wants to reject educational research, he could pay attention to the linguists and the psycholinguists who are studying second language acquisition. Um, I, I don't have time to, to quote chapter and verse of the research about, for example, how long it does take for children to acquire a reasonable vocabulary and control over English that will equip them to do good academic work, but there's a pile of books over there. Um, I don't have time to talk about them. I hope perhaps Mr. Unz will have time to read them. Uh, because they would inform him about the realities of second language acquisition. Um, 
Secondly, good educational policy is unlikely to be made by referendum. Good educational policy is unlikely to be made in such a way that there is a, a fiat, a single, a single program for all children, a one-size-fits-all policy. That's not um, the way good education works. Education is very complex, and silver bullets do not solve challenging problems. Of course, I should point out that there's if, that if even if uh, Mr. Unz got his way in transitional bilingual education were eliminated, some negative consequences that he would acknowledge as negative consequences will come along with that. Older children whom he agrees need bilingual education probably won't get it. Two-way programs and maintenance bilingual programs that are actually producing bilinguals much better than foreign language classrooms in U.S. Class, in US schools are um, will also be eliminated in the process. And finally, um, he suggests that parents uh, boycotted bilingual programs because they didn't have any alternative. The fact of the matter is that in that every state in the union, parents have a choice about bilingual or English-only programs. They simply have to ask to get their children out of bilingual. Don't, we do not need to destroy bilingual education in order to protect the rights of individual parents, which already exist, to choose English-only programs if that's what they want. Professor Snow raised a number of very important issues, which I'm glad I'll now be able to address. The nature of this debate is a little bit strange to me, because it mimics so much the debate I had several years ago during the California campaign. The difference is the facts are now in. The largest controlled educational experiment in the history of the world took place a few years ago, involving over a million students in California who were largely shifted away from bilingual education to English immersion. During that campaign, the supporters of bilingual education refused to defend their existing program. They admitted it had terrible problems, but they said the alternative would be worse. Getting rid of these programs would be a disaster. Instead, the average test scores of over a million immigrant students have gone up by 50% in less than three years. Those school districts that most strictly and completely followed the initiative and got rid of their bilingual programs doubled their test scores in less than three years. Don't believe me, believe the New York Times, the Washington Post, CBS News, every major media source in the United States. The war is over, or at least it should be over if academics were willing to look at the reality of the world rather than their own research. And again, don't take my word for it. One of the strongest advocates we have now for Prop 227 in California is an individual who for 30 years was a bilingual education teacher. He became a school superintendent. He ended up opposing the initiative when it was on the ballot. He urged people to vote no. When it passed, though, he said the law is the law. The law has to be obeyed. He followed the initiative, got rid of his bilingual programs. His student immigrant test scores doubled in less than two years, and he became a born-again convert to English immersion. He now admits he was wrong for 30 years. Bilingual education does not work. English immersion does work. And he was the founder of the California Association of Bilingual Educators. He admits he was wrong for 30 years. Or take, for example, a man named Reed Hastings. He's the liberal Democrat who's the president of the California State Board of Education appointed by Governor Gray Davis. He opposed the initiative when it was on the ballot. He said it was one size fits all. The results have been so phenomenally good. He's been trying to get those school districts that have blocked the initiative and tried to avoid implementing it to back down and follow the law. He originally grew up in Massachusetts, and when he found out I was doing an initiative here, he not only endorsed it, but he wrote a $20,000 check to underscore his endorsement because he wants to improve the education of immigrant children in Massachusetts just the way it happened in California. Now, again, I'm a theoretical physics. I'm somebody who comes from a theoretical physics background. I'm an academic by training. I think academics should look at the reality of the world rather than their theories that are published in a lot of books, which may or may not be correct. The point about it is all the academics who support bilingual education, they all believe, and publicly many times willing to state, that it takes a young child five to seven years to learn English. Some of them actually claim 10 years. I would say this, I urge every voter in Massachusetts who honestly believes it takes five to seven years for a young child to learn English to vote no on our initiative. Make up your own mind. If you really think 
A child who starts ki kindergarten in the United States will require until junior high to actually learn English. I urge you to oppose our initiative. Furthermore, the academics who support bilingual education all claim that the older you are, the easier it is to learn another language. They claim adults learn a new language easier than teenagers, teenagers easier than little children. They are the only people in the world who believe that. Anyone who honestly believes that the older you are, the easier it is to learn another language should vote no on our initiative. It's as simple as that. For the other 99.5% of the people in Massachusetts or the United States, I urge you to vote yes. Again, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The test scores of over a million immigrant students in California have risen dramatically. Their parents are happy. Their teachers are happy. The people who oppose the initiative now support it. Now, why would that be happening if I were wrong and if the initiative didn't work? I think you have to really ask yourself whether the problem in these immigrant test scores we've seen over all these years is in spite of bilingual education or is because of bilingual education. Think of a very simple fact. In California and in the rest of the United States, children enter the public schools speaking up to 140 different languages. In almost all of these parts of the country, including in California, the only group of students that receives any significant quantity of these allegedly beneficial bilingual programs are Latino students. All the other language groups are given the equivalent of English immersion immediately. They're taught English as soon as they start school. Now, by an amazing coincidence, the one immigrant group in the United States that does the worst in school, with the highest dropout rates and the lowest test scores and the lowest rate of admissions to college are Latino students. Now, that doesn't prove that the fault is bilingual education, but if the one group that gets the most bilingual education of all the immigrant groups does the worst in school, it certainly starts to shift the burden of proof over to the other side. And now that getting rid of these programs in California has so dramatically improved the academic performance of those Latino students, you really have to ask yourself, whether you should believe the reality of your own senses, the test scores of a million immigrant students in California, or four or five books piled there written by some professors at Harvard and a few other universities. Again, reality trumps theory. Theory cannot defeat reality. And the reality of a million students in California is not something that a few professors can whisk away by citing a couple of books. Again, don't believe me believe the New York Times, the Washington Post, USA Today, every major investigative reporter in the United States, bilingual education does not work and has never worked anywhere in the United States or in the world on a large scale. Thank you very much. See, I think you kind of violated the three minutes there, Ron, but I will uh, attempt not to, uh, not to match you in length of uh, rebuttal. First of all, um, let me say in California, it might be the case. I try not to talk about things I don't know a lot about. Um, <laughs> that that only, only Latino children are receiving bilingual education. Right here in Cambridge, I would point out, there is a maintenance bilingual program in Chinese, one in Korean, one in Creole, one in Portuguese. There is a two-way program in, in, um, in Spanish. Uh, in, there are Chinese uh, and Khmer and Japanese and Russian and Hebrew bilingual programs within 10 miles of where we are right now. So that is simply not true in Massachusetts. And it's one of the, one of the reasons why um, making educational policy by referendum is really a bad idea. You get a one-size-fits-all analysis of the problem and a one-size-fits-all purported solution to the problem. All right, so let's talk about the test scores in California. Um, now, I notice you're talking about the test scores. Uh, why aren't you talking about the reclassification rates? The reclassification rates, which, remember the, remember the claim, 95% failure because only 5% reclassification? Well, since 1998 and the introduction of intensive immersion programs for children in California, the reclassification rates have soared to 7%. Right now, the average reclassification rates across the state of Massachusetts range from 17 to 25 percent in different um, school districts. What that means is that in Massachusetts, on average, children are getting out of bilingual programs in four to five years. 
Um, in California, evidently they were not. Once again, Massachusetts and California are different places. Perhaps we do not need California's initiative to solve Massachusetts educational problems. And now let me just talk about the, the test scores. Um, it's true. A million LEP children in California have seen uh, very in significant increases in their test scores over the last three years. So have several million non-LEP students in California. The fact of the matter is that uh, five years ago, California ranked 48th in the nation in educational achievement. This is a position from which it's not hard to raise your test scores. <laughs> the governor of California at that point decided he would invest lots more money in education. Uh, statewide uh, norms were put, standards were put in place for literacy and math teaching. New um, tests were introduced, the SAT-9, introduced in 1998. Uh, class size was reduced in primary school. And uh, the Proposition 227 was passed. Which of these many changes is responsible for improvement in educational outcome? Well, if it was only LEP children in California whose test scores had gone up, we might say it was Proposition 227. But the fact of the matter is that everybody's test scores in California are going up. And in fact, if you look across the state of California at kids in intensive immersion, in kids who are still in bilingual programs, and um, native English-speaking children or children who are not uh, requiring uh, special attention because of language learning, you will find that uh, all of their test scores are going up more or less equivalently. The gap between the native English speakers and the non-native speakers is not decreasing, unfortunately, but uh, the, the difference between intensive immersion and bilingual education is uh, actually in favor of bilingual ed programs. Now, Mr. Unz, who seems to take his data from newspapers, <laughs> rather than uh, the, the state scores, um, talks about Oceanside, I think it is, right? Is Oceanside the- One of many. The poster, the poster district? Um, well, for every Oceanside, I have to tell you, there's an Ocean View. Ocean View is a, is a district which also uh, moved from bilingual education to, uh, to intensive uh, immersion programs. And there, the test scores haven't risen at all. The fact of the matter is that the SAT-9, which is not a test that's designed for second language speakers of English, is a test on which you can double your score by getting one or two more items correct when you're a five-year-old. It is a very poor, poor test. It does not reflect the kinds of things we really want uh, kindergartners and first graders to be learning. They need to be learning lots of language and they need to be learning the skills that will enable them to read, to reason mathematically, to do science. Those are not skills that are, are uh, tested in the SAT-9. Improvements in scores in the SAT-9 are, are transient in terms of real educational outcomes. The outcomes that we want to look at are learning and achievement, comprehension, reasoning, um, math, and science. The SAT-9 is, is an epiphenomenon. And if these scores, even if these scores really are higher, it doesn't matter at all. It does not reflect improved educational outcomes. Let's look at classification rates. I'm in favor of reclassification. I think kids should be in mainstream programs within three or four or five years. That's something that Proposition 227 in California has not impacted at all. I'm just going to take a few minutes to ask each of you a couple of questions before we turn it over to audience questions. Now, the, the program, Proposition 227, has only been in effect in, in California for three years. That's not a very long time, even though you have cited some successes. It's not a long time. How do you know that over the long haul, whether it's three more years or 30 more years, that it will continue, it will continue to have the same type of success that it's that it's had now. You've raised a very good point. Now, during the campaign, the, uh, let's see, can you hear this? Are we getting There's sound? There's a, a slight echo. I, I can't hear that it's, okay. is it distorted? Okay. I'm working on it. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll just talk loudly anyway. 
You've raised a very good point. During the campaign for 227, which occurred in 1998, the opponents of the initiative, again, refused to defend the existing status quo. They said, oh, we know we have problems in the schools, but they said if the measure passed, the result would be a catastrophe. Test scores would plummet. These very low test scores would get much, much worse. Instead, and again, I repeat this one more time, the average test scores of over a million immigrant students have gone up by 40% in less than two years and continue that rise, so it's now 50% in less than three years. Furthermore, those school districts, when you look at the state of California, that tried to keep their bilingual programs showed little, if any, improvement. Those that got rid of their bilingual programs showed dramatic gains. The 40 or 50% average includes a number of 100% gains and a number of 10 or 15% gains in those districts that resisted the initiative. And it didn't only persuade people who already believed in the issue, it persuaded many of the people who opposed the initiative. Now, if we're talking about 10 or 15 or 29 years down the road, it could be that if you take young children and teach them English when they're in kindergarten, when they reach the age of 40 or 50, their brains explode. And we'll have terrible catastrophes happening in 2020 or 2030 because of this initiative that we implemented now. But when we're doing any sort of scientific analysis, we have to look at the reality of what's happening. The reality is the first year test scores went up by 20%, the second year they went up by another 20%, and now in the third year they've gone up by about another 15%. We're talking about no evidence whatsoever of any adverse consequences the parents are very pleased. The children are doing very well in school. They're well adjusted. They seem very happy. They are learning English, and they are learning exactly the same sort of English that all these other immigrant groups were learning. Now, it is true. Massachusetts is one of the very few states that has bilingual programs for non-Hispanic students. Virtually everywhere else in the country, bilingual programs are almost solely for Hispanic students, and all the non-Hispanic immigrant students have been always taught English during this 30-year period and done very well in it. Now, maybe there's something different in the brains of Hispanic students than non-Hispanic students. All the others, all the others, excuse me, excuse me, maybe, maybe there's some mysterious thing that means Hispanic students need bilingual education, none of the others do, but there seems no evidence for that whatsoever. The point is, if you get rid of these programs, I think the Hispanic students will do just as well as all the non-Hispanic students. California has the largest Spanish speaking. California does have one of the largest Spanish speaking populations in the country. And in, in same in Massachusetts, that we do have a primary, uh, most of the, the non-English speakers are Spanish speakers, but there are a whole lot of others. Now, how much, um, how do you compare these programs with various languages? How do you compare a program, and, and this, you know, I want you to chime in here too. This is a, sh a short-term program. How much study do you need? How much time do you take to, to ensure that a program is successful? How do you compare it to the program that was in place, the, the bilingual education that we have in place now? How do you compare it to an immersion program? Is there a way to do that, to say this is successful and this was not? Ideally, of course, you'd do a proper experiment. You'd, um, al you'd randomly assign children to a uh, structured immersion or a bilingual program, and you would make sure that the structured immersion program was as good as it could possibly be and that the bilingual program was as good as it could possibly be. Um, we, don't, we can't do that kind of random assignment study. So, um, in fact, what ends up happening is people make inferences from comparing uh, fourth graders now and fourth graders five years ago, you're not looking at the same children. You're looking at different cohorts of children. Another very good design would be to actually look at children, follow them through their schooling. Um, and that's what I'm proposing uh, will ultimately reveal the negative consequences of structured immersion for the children who are in it now um, and were in it last year. That while, of course, if you spend six hours a day learning learning English other than only three hours a day learning English at the end of the year, you might know some more words in English, that if you have not acquired sufficient English competence to actually deal with the academic challenges of third, fourth, and fifth grade school, you will start to show decreasing test scores. You have to do the longitudinal study in order to be able to see that effect. Now, once again, let me say, 
Mr. Ons keeps saying the million LEP children have increased their test scores enormously in California, and that's true. <laughs> so have the non-LEP children. So have the LEP children in bilingual education. The comparison that he is offering you is a comparison based on a couple of poster school districts and not looking across the entire state of California at an honest comparison of all the children in substance immersion and all the children still If I can respond to that, Professor yeah. Snow is simply factually in error on that point. There have been studies done across the state of California examining all of the million students we're talking about. In fact, probably the best study was done by the San Jose Mercury News, a very well-regarded paper, excuse me, a very well-regarded paper uh, that had opposed the initiative. It had opposed Proposition 227, urged people to vote against it. After the initiative passed, it spent several months after the first year of test scores doing a statewide quantitative analysis of all the students in the state of California, those who stayed in schools that kept their bilingual programs, those that shifted to in intensive English immersion programs with rapid mainstreaming, and the results they proclaimed in a banner headline on the front page was the fact that the students in the English immersion schools and districts showed test scores depending on grade and subject level that were 20%, 40%, even 100% higher across a million students statewide than the ones who stayed in the bilingual program. And that was after one year. Or if you take, for example, two neighboring school districts, a perfect controlled experiment, Oceanside and Vista are both medium-sized school districts right next, it, down near San Diego. They both have heavy Latino immigrant populations, very similar demographics, similar size, everything about them is the same. The advocates of bilingual education always pointed to Vista at the time of the campaign and afterwards as the district that was having some of the best bilingual programs in the state that were keeping their bilingual programs despite the initiative. Oceanside was always denounced by those people as the district that most completely got rid of all their bilingual programs and was doing everything wrong. After two years of test scores, the VISTA scores had moved up virtually not at all. There had been virtually no improvement among immigrant students in VISTA and reading, while the Oceanside test scores had doubled. Now, when you have two neighboring school districts very similar, both groups on both sides admit one of them is bilingual, one of them is anti-bilingual. One of them shows vi very little improvement at all, and the other doubles their test scores. That's a very useful piece of evidence. And again, a statewide analysis of all the million students showed dramatic gains for the bilingual students as opposed uh, for the non-bilingual class students as opposed to the ones that stayed in the bilingual districts. The facts are in. It's absolutely clear-cut. And that's the reason all of these people I was talking about in California have switched their sides on the issue. Mr. Mr. What Mr. does this I'm evidence tell you? Well, I'd just like to ask Mr. Ons a question. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist, he tells me. Now, when the, when the San Jose Mercury reported uh, cold fusion, did you believe it? <laughs> Do you think that is the test for uh, data analysis and drawing conclusions? There are statisticians, there are psychometricians, there are uh, researchers in California who give a totally different reading to the California to data. I'm supposed to believe the San Jose Mercury? Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. On that point, we're talking, <laughs> excuse me. I, I hate to get personal here, but well, we are talking. Let, let, okay, let's, no, okay. Let's not, no, not, personal. not personal. Not personal. <laughs> personal in a general way. We are talking about a program, bilingual education, that has been imposed in the United States and supported for decades by the educational theoretical establishment. And endless numbers of professors of education all believe in bilingual education. In fact, I would argue that the number of academics, professors of education, who support bilingual education outnumbers those who oppose bilingual education by probably about a thousand to one. If you go to all the professors of bilingual education and you ask them whether bilingual education works, they will say, of course it works. I'm a professor of bilingual education. I believe in bilingual education. I've always believed in bilingual education. Unfortunately, the reality is contrary. The analysis the Mercury News did was not a complex type of analysis. If you simply look at the test scores, of those students in districts that kept their bilingual programs statewide, and you compare it to the test scores of those students in districts that got rid of their bilingual programs, you see a gigantic difference across the state of California and a million students. Reality trumps theory. And to be honest, in past decades, in past eras, there were many professors of theoretical physics who were totally wrong. They believed in nonsense. And after a while, they all died off 
and a new generation of professors arose that believed in reality. What we are seeing now is the collapse of a gigantic group of theorists who believed in bilingual education for 30 years, and because of that belief, and because of that advocacy, and because of those books there, destroyed the lives of millions upon millions of students in America during that period. That is what the history books will write. Okay, Ron, we're all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> you too. <laughs> Have we crippled the students who have come up in the last 30 years? Have we, crippled, have we crippled the students who come up in the last 30 years? Of course not. Uh, once again, I am not defending poor educational programs. I cannot defend poor bilingual programs, and I certainly cannot defend poor immersion programs. And they're out there on both sides. Good programs trump pro program quality trumps program type. I, I'm quite sure that's true. So it, of course, if, if uh, a school district determines that it's going to put a lot of energy into improving its reading instruction, improving its math instruction, uh, and teaching its children English, it can get improved outcomes. And if it, it can choose to do that with an, a, a structured immersion program, or it can choose to do that with a bilingual program. The fact of the matter is that the program quality is very important. But I um, could mention dozens of Students I know, for example, who've gotten into Harvard, who are products of bilingual programs. These, these are people whose lives have been enhanced by bilingual programs. I could take you down the street and show you two-way bilingual programs where not only Spanish-speaking children, but English-speaking children feel their lives are being enhanced by the opportunity to develop bilingual skills from kindergarten on through, through elementary school. The notion that bilingual education, that good bilingual education is bad for children is simply nonsense. Is, is it a district's commitment to bilingual, in, and bilingual can mean a lot of things, whether it, it's immersion or the traditional bilingual, is it the district's commitment to what you do with students who don't speak English as a first language that makes the biggest difference? I would argue, again, very simply and straightforwardly, bilingual education has never worked anywhere in America on a large scale in 30 years. You can find, with any sort of theory, you can always find a few isolated cases where it might work under ideal laboratory conditions. You can find a classroom where it works. You might be able to find a school where it works. Allegedly, you might be able to find a very small school district where it works. But there has been no large-scale example anywhere in America in 30 years where bilingual programs work. And I've, again, repeatedly asked the advocates of bilingual education to point to any large school district anywhere in America that they can cite as a successful example of implementing their programs, and they can't think of one. Now, if something has never worked anywhere on a large scale in 30 years, maybe it just doesn't work. And it is true that you can find dozens of students, as Professor Snow cited, who benefited tremendously from these bilingual programs. I believe that. But I think you can find dozens of millions of students who were hurt by these bilingual programs, and you have to go with the numbers. In the state of California, again, those school districts that were cited by bilingual advocates as having some of the best bilingual programs, like VISTA, that were doing everything right, they showed virtually no gain in test scores in the period following the initiative with the contrast being those districts that got rid of their bilingual programs showed enormous improvement. And let, let's look at other examples. Everybody knows that a lot of Latino immigrant students do a lot better in the Catholic schools than they do in the public schools. Many of them, in fact, if they were given the opportunity, would probably rather send their children to Catholic schools, parochial schools, rather than the public schools. Catholic schools do not use bilingual education. The students are taught English right away. Now, if these same immigrant students do so much better in Catholic school than they do in public school without bilingual programs. Couldn't part of the reason be that they're being taught English rather than being taught Spanish? And again, when we're talking about theories, anybody here who believes in this audience, anybody who believes in this audience, that the older you are, the easier it is to learn another language, should vote against our initiative, because that is the basis of these bilingual programs, which is utter nonsense. I really think. We're talking about something where these bizarre theories have been created by a line of ivory tower academics for 30 years that crippled the education of millions of students around the United States 
and now are collapsing under their own weight. And the question I have for Professor Snow is, what if your theories are wrong? What if they're actually wrong? Have you ever thought about that? And what happened, has happened to all these millions of students for all these years if those four books there or five books there are actually wrong? What, what do you think is in these five books? <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of arguments saying bilingual education works. That's exactly what's not in these okay. books. What is in these books is data about things like how long uh, it takes under various conditions to learn a second language. How long do you think it takes a young child to learn English at five years old? I think to learn the first word could take half an hour. I think to, uh, that if a, a child in, a, in an immersion classroom is learning five words of English a day, that's probably pretty good. I think by the end of a year, the child could know a thousand words of English, could have a wonderful conversation with an avuncular adult who comes in and says things like, what's your name and where do you live and what kind of games do you play? I think, however, that at the end of one year, that child will not be sufficiently proficient in English to have an easy time learning how to read in English. I think that there is a very high risk of trying to teach children to read in languages they do not speak well. And reading is the ultimate test. If children are not learning to read well, mm -hmm. school is not doing its best by them. That's an excellent statement of the case for bilingual education and the theory behind it. The theory behind it is that it's wrong to teach children English until you've spent sometimes years teaching them in Spanish, including read and writing in Spanish. I no. do. Okay, sure. Exactly. No, oh, I, th audience. I, I think our audience Perfect. really wants exactly. to chime in here. <laughs> <laughs> And, and what I want to do, it's going to be complicated because I know a lot of you want to ask both of our panelists questions. I'm going to take a question from here, a question from the center, and then a question. Well, maybe I'll start on this end. I'll, I'll defer to our, our friend John Silber, who was a former... Uh... Hold on, hold on, please be... As, 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 before you start, as we ask our panelists questions, I would ask that you be respectful of everyone in the room. Everyone has a different opinion, and please respect those opinions. <laughs> and, and by not doing, not chiming in too loudly, it will give more people an opportunity to ask questions and not make statements. Dr. Silber, I, I just want to interrupt you briefly. I, I do need a question. <laughs> I think that's probably addressed to me, is it? <laughs> <laughs> if I believed that the data in California showed that programs that had adopted intensive uh, immersion were now producing better results than programs that had retained bilingual teaching methods, I would, of course, concede that Mr. Unz had proven his point. I do not believe that. The data do not demonstrate that. The uh, findings do not support that conclusion. That reminds me of the... Do Dr. Silver, <laughs> Dr. Silver. 
And I, I want to here in the center. Again, you know, I'm glad your child is doing so well. That doesn't mean that your child might not have done even better if your child hadn't been taught English immediately. Now, again, w when you're looking at it, you have to look not at one example or another example, one anecdote or another anecdote, but the result across a country or the result across a state. And the evidence when you're talking about thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of students is that the students who are given bilingual education do much worse than the students who are not given bilingual education. And that really is the way general policy has to be made. With regard to your child, our initiative in, Cal in, in Massachusetts that will be on the ballot in about a year would allow parents like you who really believe in bilingual education to apply for a waiver to place or keep your children in that program. So in other words, maybe your child is a special child who actually would benefit from bilingual education rather than be hurt by it. And if so, then you can apply for a waiver and keep your child in that program. Okay. No, we, 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 we won't have a time for a follow-up. I want to take a question from this side. Uh, gentlemen. Hi, thanks, thanks. I think it's an important debate. We, we do it productively, and I'm not sure if we're being very productive about it. But I want to uh, ask both the panelists to address why is this initiative happening? Is, is, is the audience seems overwhelmingly opposed to it? It is educational policy for sale in Massachusetts, for sale around the world, and if they are in, in, in the U.S., if we don't want this to happen, how can we prevent it from, from going through? Well, I, 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 I would say that if you don't want it to happen, or right. if you do want it to happen, you go to the poll and vote yes or no, depending on which way you yeah. feel. Well, well an initiative like this might be coming to your state as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with regard to your question, I mean, I, I can answer it a bit. Th there's a very interesting dynamic which I learned about this issue during the California campaign. All the public opinion polls in California during over a year showed that it was one of the most popular initiatives in the history of California. Yet when I attended public forums or debates, when I attended public forums or debates like this one, usually the audience was 95% against it. Sometimes it was 98%, sometimes 100%. And that's simply because the people who are most motivated to attend public forums dealing with bilingual education tend to be advocates of bilingual education, including a lot of bilingual teachers and bilingual administrators and bilingual academics. The reason this program has stayed for 30 years, even though it's never worked and been incredibly unpopular, is because it's supported by a very small but very vocal and committed group of people and opposed by the overwhelming majority of the rest of society who is home watching television. So in other words, the people who came to this forum right now believe in bilingual education, I would assume most of you based on your headbands. Well, the people who vote against bilingual education in a year's time are home watching television right now. It's not a matter of money. For example, in California, we were out spent 25 to 1 in advertising. The supporters of bilingual education spent 25 times more money in advertising than we did, but we still won in a landslide. The same thing with Arizona. And the polling numbers in Massachusetts show that support for getting rid of bilingual education is far stronger here than it ever was in California. Can I, can I just yeah. answer this question briefly? I, one of the reasons, of course, is that Ron Unz is a very good communicator. And because he presented this issue in terms that misrepresented the facts, he called the campaign English for the Children. He suggested that bilingual education is not in favor of providing English for children. If you ask any immigrant parent, well, do you want English for your child? Of course the answer is going to be yes. Um, that's part of the reason, and that's part of the reason why this conversation is very important. It's necessary to make clear to the public what this issue really is. I'm going to go back on this side of the room. In the, yeah.
question, please. I, okay. If I can, I, I think you might have your facts a bit confused because actually, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, excuse me, you. <laughs> if I can, if I can respond, it, it sounded like what you were saying is that the Asian students in California who had never had bilingual education were doing very badly in school. They're actually overrepresented at California universities by a huge fraction. So, for example, Asian students make up about 10% of California's population, but are almost 50% of the students at the top universities. So even though maybe some Asian students aren't doing well, many of them, most of them are doing very well. In fact, they're doing as well or better than the Anglo students. And I, I'm not saying the only reason is because they never had bilingual education, but the fact that they're doing so well in universities and they never had bilingual education, again, I think reinforces my case that maybe one reason the Hispanic students in California are doing so badly is that they had bilingual education. But if you're Did a son, I mean, that fact that has something to do with what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My name is Anthony Hernandez, and I'm a co-president of Alana here at the school. I'm a master's degree student. I'm also a member of Comunidad Latina, which is a Latino student organization. I was interested in what you said about theory and reality. The, the, the theory that you have is that this test kind of addressed people equally across the board without considering uh, their cultural backgrounds. And I'm wondering if you could speak about the test and how they addressed these different backgrounds. Did everybody have the same socioeconomic background? I'd like you to speak about that. You've raised a very good point. And obviously, <laughs> Latino students, for example, in California tend to be disproportionately overrepresented as being from poor families or poorly educated families, immigrant families. And for example, in Oceanside and in Vista, the students, the immigrant students in both those districts tend to come from poor farm worker families. So they certainly have a lot of cultural and educational disadvantages. And that's why the fact that one district students did so well after the initiative passed and they got rid of bilingual education, and the other district that had exactly the same sort of immigrant students, their students did so much less well, I think is a sign that you have an interesting comparison. The tests basically involve reading, mathematics, subjects like that, and I think most of the parents are much happier when the students double their test scores on the test than if they don't do well, and that's why they're happy about the initiative. And on this side, in the front here. You've raised a very, very good point. And actually, that's, no, seriously. Our initiative makes a clear distinction between older students and younger students. In other words, students who are 10 years and older would have a much easier time getting a waiver to be placed or kept in a bilingual program as opposed to English immersion. Now, again, the theorists who believe in bilingual education and development actually think that the older you are, the easier it is to learn another language. So they would say older students would have an easier time in English immersion than younger students, but I think that's nonsense. The point about it is that under our initiative, we make that distinction. And now, you know, I'd like to say, I actually have talked with a lot of immigrants. I, I know a lot of immigrants. I work with them. I know a lot of them. I've actually asked them their opinion about English immersion, even for older students, because many of them arrived in the United States when they were 12 or 13. Most of them seem to believe that even at that age, it's better to be intensively taught English than to be taught academic subjects in your native language while you're learning English. So my uh, division of opinion on that, but I do believe at least you can make a case in favor of bilingual education for older students, where I think there's no case in the world, no logical case in the world, 
as to why you don't teach a five-year-old immigrant child English immediately once they start kindergarten. And that is the key issue involved. One, one follow-on point, which really is an important... I do want you to okay. keep your answers brief, too, because we sure. don't have... A There's one very on. important statistic I should give you. Over half of all the... Over half of all the immigrants... No, it really is important. Over half of all the... Over half of all the immigrant students in the United States who are classified as not knowing English were actually born in America. Most of the remainder came here when they were very young. So the vast, vast majority of so-called limited English students actually started school in the United States when they were five or six years old. There are relatively few who came here at 12 or 13. The reason that they don't know English when they're 12 or 13 is many times that they've been in these Spanish almost only classes for six or seven years, and that's the problem. Professor Snow? What am I answering here? <laughs> well, I mean, there is a school of thought that says younger students oh, younger generally... Versus older. All right. Well, I happen... I, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to... Um, have to admit here that I've actually collected data on speed of language acquisition among older and younger uh, second language learners. I mean, like testing the kids, going and see them every six weeks and figuring out how much they learned in the six-week intervals. And my data are pretty clear that 12-year-olds are much faster language learners than five-year-olds. So although you might ridicule this perspective, uh, I can't abandon it because it's not a theory. It's actually based on hard data. So my sense is that um, older learners can, in fact, acquire a second language quickly enough in an immersion setting. And I think if you're giving waivers easily, you should give the waivers for the children under 10, not over 10. And no, no, I, oh, sure. we're, what we're going to do is go around one more time, because we're, we're almost out of time. And each, each of our panelists will be giving a summary statement. So this gentleman here. I wonder, uh, you are saying that in the past 30 years, while in your program, as a material in the United States, so let's put the larger picture. But recent uh, studies, American students have failed all the national in other subject areas like math and science. So are you advocating again that we should get rid of all of the math program and the science program in the United States? The problem is not so much that some bilingual programs have failed, but no bilingual program has ever succeeded in the entire United States on a large scale. And if you have a 100% failure rate, I think the thing really is a failure. We disagree on that claim. Absolutely. I have a, I, Would this gentleman here? Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm not a bilingual educator. I'm not an educator. I'm a journalist who does social policy. You should love me. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want to take this from the social policy angle and talk about politics. And my definition of politics is two questions with four words. Who benefits? Who decides? Now, most of the social policy, education policy in this country over the past 30 years has been based on the assumption of a deficit model when it came to urban, urban education. And unfortunately, the funding tended to match that deficit approach which is there wasn't much funding. Now, taking the data that you put out in terms of failure rate for bilingual ed, you know, the question for me is trying to dig below that surface, what factors are relevant to look at that? Now, there's a number of factors, including funding, program size, and all that that you can go into, but I want to kind of jump really quickly to an analogy that I think you'll like as a theoretical physicist. Suppose Einstein, during his time, trying to prove that nuclear fission works, tried to get fission by striking two pieces of pitch blend together for a spark. I don't think he'd wind up with fission, and I suspect that the way that you're interpreting data is pretty much the same. You're striking <coughs> two programs together, hoping for a spark, and there's not a spark. It's not how it works. Well, to the extent that you were talking about who benefits from these programs, that really raises a very important issue which I should respond to. We have what might be called the bilingual education industry in the United States. In other words, you have the bilingual teachers and the bilingual administrators, the bilingual academics, the bilingual textbook manufacturers, the bilingual coordinators. They benefit from bilingual education, whether it works or it doesn't work. 
they are the mobilized group that keeps this program in place even though it doesn't work. Another example of somebody who benefits, we were outspent again 25 to 1 in advertising in California. The reason we were outspent is one individual made the largest political contribution in the history of California, millions of dollars to oppose our initiative campaign. That individual is not Hispanic. He's a Republican billionaire. He doesn't even speak Spanish. And his connection to the issue is that he owns Cal America's largest Spanish language television network. Now, one could argue that if children learn English in school, they'll watch more English TV and less Spanish TV. If his ratings fall by one point, he loses hundreds of millions of dollars of personal net worth. He's a billionaire. And so po possibly that's the reason he spent millions of dollars to defeat an initiative that would have taught English to children. Maybe that's the connection. Well, I, I, I want to get someone from over here because we really don't have a lot of time. I know there are a lot of people who want to ask Hello, questions. Marjorie from Southern California, I have something to say. <laughs> Well, the truth is the test scores of the older students in California have really changed very little by comparison. And, and the reason for that is it's contrary to what Professor Snow believes, it's easier for young children to learn English than older children. In other words, if you teach children English when they're five or six, they'll learn it. If you try to teach it to them when they're 12 or 13, it's a lot harder. For that reason, the impact of Prop 227 has been greatest in the earlier grades. There's been no rise in dropout rates whatsoever. And in fact, all the anecdotal evidence when reporters come in and talk with children in the classroom or their parents or teachers, they say the children are much more enthusiastic about going to school now that these bilingual programs have been gotten rid of than they were before. Would you like to? Yeah. Okay, what, what I'm going to do now, um, we only have this room until 7.30, and it's almost 7.30 now. And I apologize to all of you who have your hands up, and I, I have not been able to get to you. We have a, a short amount of time. Um, we have two minutes for summary statements from each of you. And I want to start with you, and then you can have the, the last word. Please be respectful of the way the panel is structured. Thank you. One, one, one aspect, again, that I'm very glad we were able to bring out is the question that Professor Snow, who's one of the most prominent pro-bilingual academic theorists in the United States, does believe that the older you are, the easier it is to learn another language. Any of you who believe in that should work very hard to defeat our initiative, because then it will be harmful for students if that theory is true. If the theory is false, and if I am correct, and that the younger you are, the easier it is to learn another language, you should all support our initiative. And I'm very glad that Professor Snow has now made it extremely clear that she, along with all of these other bilingual theorists that I've talked to, really does believe in that theory. I have no choice but to believe in the theory that the data support. Uh, the best support that Mr. Unz has been able to offer for the positive impact of uh, his, his program, his preferred program, Structured Immersion, has been the analysis of the San Jose Mercury News. This does not convince me. The fact of the matter is that we have to recognize that while children are learning English, they need to be learning. And if they have access to education in their native languages, they can be learning important content material. They can be learning things about math and science and how to read. They can then make use of that knowledge when they have acquired sufficient levels of proficiency in English. Learning English faster doesn't mean you learn English better. I'd like to thank Professor Snow and Ron Unz for taking time to discuss this topic with us. And I'd like to thank all of you for being a very attentive audience that added to the discussion. And thank you to Harvard.